All right, guys, good morning for me. Good evening for most of you. Thanks for joining on this Monday. So last week we kind of mentioned just about the approach of purchasing and we started to get into segmenting, which is basically how we divide up the market. And, you know, there's characteristics, there's all these different options to how you want to divide up the market so that you know what is your right point of attack or the right place that you should focus on. Now, one of the things that is important about segmentation is research, right? You have to do your research. You have to know exactly what's going on in the area you want to purchase or to invest in, right? You have to know everything that's going on from population to business to, you know, crime, all of these things that are important to the common human being, just to the individual themselves. You have to know what's going on, right? Could there be potential income issues, right? If people wanted to live in the area, is rent going up? Is the prices of homes going up, right? And by how much? So all of these things are important. Even if they may seem, you know, over your head that you don't understand them or you don't see the importance, it's not about what we think is important. It's about our target consumer. Our target consumer is what most is what is most important. What daily issues are they dealing with? You know, for us as an investor, the first thing we're thinking about is how do we get our money back? I invested, you know, a couple million. How do I start getting that back? Whereas if we focused on the consumer and the target market of people that we were looking at to purchase this property, to live in it, to, you know, grow their family or whatever it may be, that should be our focus. And once that focus actually happens, we can see, you know, where our profit actually starts to work and you know grow for us in the way that we want so here's the thing right there's no right or wrong way to do research there is no thing to focus on it's not that simple right everyone can do things a variety of different ways it doesn't matter how it's done. It just has to be done, right? Just like a lot of times in life, there aren't a set universal standard or procedure of ways to get things done. It just has to be done. You could do it in the way that is easy for you or for your group or the person or whoever's doing it, right? You just have to do it. So this is the cycle, right? You always collect data, right? Look at results. Results aren't good enough. You refine your results. And then you keep narrowing down till you find exactly what you need, and what exactly you were looking for, right? Again, all research is an aspect of someone's story right we can get information from people from other organizations you know companies friends and family focus groups we can get information in a variety of different ways but what's the most helpful way Right, we also need to look at how we collect it. 
and the assumptions about market segments have to be taken into account and be on the forefront. So natural assumptions are usually by income, right? Because of the location, family size, and all these other type of things, you know, social influences, you know, whatever your first language is, all those types of things are important. And then we also have to understand before we go get this research, what the market is like at the same time, right? Not what it could be or going to be in the future, what it is at the current moment, because you're making the purchase and gathering information on the current moment, right? The future doesn't really help you because the current moment is the determinant of what's going on. Right? So after we gather the research, you have to write a story. You have to tell what's going on. Because for those who don't do the research, they don't understand. And when you don't understand, you can't see the premise, you can't see the importance, you can't see the pure purpose of an area because you don't understand. Right. And then you start looking at the research that was done. Is it finite enough? Did I get enough information? Did I talk to enough people? Or what did I, you know, did I hit everything on the nose? All of these things, it's not second guessing yourself. It's just making sure that you have all the information possible to make an educated decision. That's what's most important, is making a decision with the correct amount of information necessary that allows you to be able to freely see if there's a profitable feature in this venture. Right? So we have different types of approaches. We have the story approach, which you begin with the property, you know, with the property area, the market segments and then you build outward right it's kind of like baking bread you know you have the yeast and all the materials and then you put it in the oven and the oven is just raw but once it actually starts to heat and bake it starts to you know rise and it starts to widen that's the story approach we're building 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 so we hit this point where it's completely understood. Or the purpose gets met. And then these are examples of actual property market research. What you do is you take a property that's in the progress of actually being built or on the verge of actually being filled with actual potential clients and residents and all of that and you dissect everything that they have done to see how you look differently to a more effective way right so these are literal examples uh this is the elysian forest which was a planned development where you know you had an idea of single family homes and townhouses townhouses are basically almost like homes it's just that it's taking all the maintenance and stuff is taken care of by the actual property managers and those who own the building a little bit smaller lots and with townhomes you have a common area and recreational facility and you may share a wall So, you know, we, as a researcher for a project, you would look at all numbers. Numbers are important. So these were projected sales. And then this is the style and how it looked. And how it differed from the other homes, a little bit more modern. 
and then there's the actual design of the building itself. And right. The story for Elisha was we we're targeting upper income. So the properties were a little bit more expensive. The top 30% of household income. Mm. We're talking about single parents, right? All these older people. Because we were looking at one level. Um, easy to get to, quick to work, parks are close by. And then what's the competition? So these are people that they were targeting to and what was exactly their focus, right? You have to look at exactly what they're doing to get to that point, right? This is our analysis and everything like that. This is just part of exactly what we need to look at. So, well, the first initial step of data was the census, right? The census is income and a bunch of other things, um, ethnicity. Remember, and here's the key part to remember all of this information is public and voluntary, right? What I mean by that is you can look up the information, but for those who posted the information, it is voluntary they don't have to do it they just chose to give up that information so people know exactly what's going on so this is just how many people were willingly able and decided to give up information about the market in the air. So looking these numbers projected on everything, they figured every year they would sell more homes because it was necessary. So they did, which was great. They built out units so that people can actually see what the home may look like. The project went to foreclosure. So, so you have issues exactly with, you know, if the research showed it was there, sometimes it's the other end. It's the company itself when it comes to execution. So that could be bad customer service. That could be, that could be where it's just straight, simple and straightforward for declining to purchase, a lot of things could have factored into that. And since we don't necessarily know, not just us, the public, but the actual company itself, since they couldn't really tell, it ends up not happening. So I mean, somebody has to come in and pick up the pieces.
Yeah. So now we have case building. That means you're in a commercial area with also a bunch of other things around cars, schools, businesses, no large offices. So us. Sorry about that, guys. As my internet was acting up pretty briefly. So, in this case study, we we're looking at a generic office building that usually focused on um, businesses that would need office space of 25 employees. Nothing in particular as in plumbing or laboratory or doctor's offices or anything like that. So, you're just your standard basic. Um, office building, right? So they understood who their consume their customers were, and those who will be looking into the property. The opportunity for businesses to be a lot of businesses to be in a environment that they know, you know, it's already within an area that they know. Most places. You know, most large offices move to the city, they stay further out because of accessibility and it's also cheaper, right? So those that are in the city, they want small businesses to be able to have street exposure, easy parking, which is for most people in a major city, Com the potential for employees to commute so that they don't have to drive far. And if they need some support, it's close, right? So you need it to, you need that feel, you need that accessibility for these small businesses because small businesses are the key to the whole economy itself. And that's what's most important is understanding the importance of one individual business, one individual business, and then multiplying that importance to all other small businesses. So the first way that we gathered information is just by casually looking through the community, right? Talking to business owners, looking up business names and looking up all these types of things. Or we can look at the census, right? In the, in, in the business patterns of this city. Understand, like I said, location, right? If you build it, they will come. It's not always the most efficient way of getting things done, right? We also have to make sure that the data is as current as possible, as well as it not taking a lot of time and costing a lot of money. So these natural expectations, you have to weigh in so many other different factors, time, money, current options. For information all of these things that you have to be aware of things that you are naturally supposed to be doing right it is time consuming it is easy to lose track of things it's just natural it happens all the time that's why you have support within your own organization to do these research collection, data collecting, data sorting, all of these things, 
all of these things are important for every company to do because this is your company on the line. You want to take as much time as possible without taking too much time. That barrier is very, very finite. It's very, you have to be aware of how much time it takes. You have to be prepared for it, right? All of these different things. You, if you're not aware of small things, okay. But if you're not aware of a big thing, going to get it, nobody's going to help you to fix it yourself. So when it looks, you know, after doing the research, they noticed that there were fewer than 10 firms in the area that they're looking at that had more than 25 employees because these are things that they wanted to, they wanted to do, who they wanted to target, and who they knew would want to be there. But for only 10 firms to exist under their requirements prior to now, they did finish a building and most of it is vacant and the developer has disappeared. So now the developer got out because probably lost too much money. Right? So this project we're looking at three so when they add the four units and they had a gym um, of diverse not far from the airport so you can see the excitement because of location and it's only four years old all these types of things one of the weaknesses was there was no special amenities so question is what's the benefit to people that live there. You can see this as this is happening because building, I'm not offering a pure benefit. I'm just giving them something. So this is where it was going to be located. Not far from here. Simple, standard. I'm not going to draw on specific people. I just want people here. And again, they're targeting the upper third. So the upper third are those who are making at least six figures a year. However they make it. Right? So now we're looking at who our customers, where they're coming from. So they're coming from all parts of Orlando. And they wanted to be closer to work. Well, it was just, right? The closer you are to work, the less of commute the better you are as an employee or manager, supervisor, what you may be. And naturally, they use data that was collected by other people. So the question, if we're going to place ourselves in their feet, is how does this plan compare to other project focused on commuting, right? Do we need to look at other locations where new apartments are, where the jobs are, right? And, you know, we've got information to go for, and it has to be useful, right? It can't just be stuff that clearly shows that it didn't take a lot of time, it was made up. So, We need you are 100, 200. You have to go through the database of the appraiser to actually understand a lot of things. Where can I do business? How big do things need to be? Right? Who's my target audience? Who's going to come 
work here or live here. These are things you have to, have to be aware of. And if you're not aware, you're not prepared. So we're taking an estimate of an actual product, a building, a, a hotel, whatever it may be. You have to come up with estimates on time, cost, labor cost, materials, permits. All of these types of things are things that you are responsible for researching, paying for, and making sure they haven't expired before the project finishes. Right? So these are all important thing to recognize, right? How much office space does each worker get? How much does it cost for each worker to be there? All of these things are important and you have to know them and be able to present on them as you're going down the line, right? Close to completion, the, you know, before around groundbreaking, the information should be there and it just keeps getting publicized and segmented all the way down to actual completion and, you know, filling up the occupancy requirements. And so you can see what all right, we're back again. So we have to understand just from that map exactly what is important location in a lot of the places that are new where people are, would kind of go are way further out than this area. So that basically means that that's a large commute, right? Now that commute time does affect mood, it affects effort, it affects growth. A look closer. You see that jobs are very much focused on the center, not far from the airport. On the all, all of the other sides, there wasn't any jobs in that area. So placing the, the you know the apartment and the office buildings close to the airport was a smart decision. Just the way that they were developing it was not a smart. So we dissect that that map again so we can really see where we were wrong or if we were right. Now looking at this, there's an area called Airport Island. Right. And then over here, that's University of Central Florida. If 75% of people live close to the airport, why would I build outside of the airport? Not outside, right, right next door, but the vicinity, close, short distance, public transportation, car, walk, all of that stuff. So first off, we see that the location wasn't a great idea because the majority of people are in this area and they're looking for that, right? So now we're looking at the data. So you have the data, 25,000 new jobs, 25,000 jobs that are actually on the airport island. The airport is responsible for 60% of those 25,000. The new firms in this area add about 550 jobs. 
So the whole goal is to increase the growth of jobs in the area by 5.2%, which is double the average of the area at 2.5. So one of the things that we do have in this area is, is there are no comments. So you have people with the potential of buying, but just haven't done. Right. So here's a couple of things that we need to realize from all of these information that I've given you. Apartment rental rates grow at the flight of inflation. If inflation is high, then they're high. If they're low, they're low. If it's in the middle, it's in the middle. No new apartments for two years, right? Because there wasn't much success. Right, so these are all projections of the information that was given. Also, thing to know when you're a builder and you're building large buildings and things like that, everything goes out in what we call phases. You know, similar to the definition of steps, it's just that phases take, you know, if phase one takes one year, phase two can't start until after phase one is done. So it's like a staggered approach when it comes to things. So our phases are expected to give different results. So these are all things that we have to be aware of. How long it takes one thing to get done so that the next one can start. All of that. Right. So also things that we do is we look at what are some assumptions that have been done in this study or project that are most vulnerable to error? So if there's human error, standard error, computer error, which one of these areas would be the most affected by it? And how could risk be reduced? And if the job, you know, if job growth happens are we giving out positions that are safe and what i mean by that is is there an easy way for them to be injured on the job or have to leave earth if there is we got to change up the health right what you know is it capable of is the job growth capable of being a rate for the area. Now, what we mean by that is, let's say, for example, we're bringing 500 jobs. Are there more than enough people that don't have a position that are willing to do this? You don't know that till you actually get into it. That's the hard part. How can I reduce risk? Reducing risk, you know, leads to the overall health of the project. And what I mean by that, it allows for people to see the projected numbers as well as how it helps the consumers in the area itself right it's not all about the company it's about the people right real estate is for the people right so you know just a couple observations like I said before, market analysis is always a story to tell. We are literally 
updating and giving an analysis to the people that live in the area so that other people can use that to their advantage. So now, since, you know, most market analysis don't deal with just numbers, it's almost impossible to do. Your goal is to put together evidence so that the decision makers can make a decision. Is it right? So now you're trying to, after you go view the property, you select it in order to write a proposal to take to people to who get it to understand money and understand value and when the return on investment is going to happen. So James Grass can't say when you buy real estate, you're buying a set of assumptions about the future, which is true, right? As soon as we purchase a home, we're already assuming things about our future. How long we want to be there? Huge assumption, huge idea. But when you say things like that, people don't actually recognize what you're trying to say, right? As a homeowner, you don't know how long you're going to stay. You may say, say, I want to live here forever. I want to die here. Things change. The city changes. The people change. The house changes. Do you want to keep up with it or do you want to give it away? These are things to think about. Also, not every real estate market is the same, right? Apart are less, right? And what I mean by that is it takes less time to actually do it. So you can do a couple cycles and analysis on apartments. Business cycles are hard because if you have a business partner, you're sitting down after results of every project, every research, every whatever it may be, right? Now, if we have a longer construction time where people don't meet deadlines, the cycle stretches out longer. So just a couple of things to remember. You can pay someone else to do it. Completely up to you. So, an example, right? Office buildings are different, apartment vacancy, right? So, you look at vacancy in places. You see how this is a cycle, it goes up and down, and there's no consistency. There's a lot of reasons for that. There is, you know, home availability, people moving away, all of these types of things, all these factors that we're not aware of happen all the time. 
So we have to be prepared for it. When it's something like this, you can't really prepare for it. Because things go in waves, right? Ups and downs, peaks and valleys. But it's kind of unpredictable. Right, so there are actual, like I said, companies that do this stuff, right? GIS, they do all all the information that we would do on our own. You can pay someone else to do it. Like I said, it really just depends what you're looking at. This is the area. So from survey research, there's a lot of things that you can do. Surveys are very, very important and very powerful because you are asking direct questions to potential tenants. And you just have to make sure you use the information wisely and you get permission. Right? You also have a risk involved in the actual questions. Is what you're asking too invasive? Is there, you know, information that you do need that you forgot? All of these things are important, and you have to do it right the first time. If you do it wrong, then potential for issues, or you might not get data that you can use. Right. So that is chapter six. We are going to take a 15-minute break, and then we will start on chapter seven, and then we'll end for the day. See you guys in 15 minutes.
All right. So next, after actually doing our research, right? Research is the most important and probably the longest aspect of this process. The next step is trying to gather an accurate valuation. How much could this property be worth if we're purchasing it, right? And how much could it be worth if we're renovating and rehabbing after that? Or how much, are, how much is it worth if we're just already have it completed and we are just purchasing as it is so when we're doing evaluation there's a lot of things that we need when this is happening and in commercial real estate this is very important right even if you're purchasing single family homes it's important as well we do evaluation when we're looking at purchasing a property, when we are looking at modernizing. So that's rehabbing and updating, renovating, leaving a property or tearing it down. Also developing, again, you know, extra parts outside of the actual building. And if we're using it as collateral for Here you can you can purchase a bigger building. So let's say that you want to purchase the Empire State Building, right? But you own 18 other buildings. It doesn't matter what it is. You can use those buildings as collateral to show proof that you have a lot of the money needed in liquid. So if something goes wrong, you can sell it. The properties that you put up for collateral will still keep the big one that she used it for. And then pay off to whatever balances you have. So when we look at valuation, we have three actual aspects of it. You have the market value, which is the market telling you how much it costs, which is usually as close to selling price as normal. You have investment value which is the value that is given to a particular investor themselves and the actual price paid for the property, which is the transaction price. Because remember, it includes fees, title changes, right, changes in ownership, and all of these things. That's what's important. So who actually looks, takes a look at market value? Everybody. Right, court systems, mortgage lenders, corporate, you know, companies that acquire and sell, buyers, sellers. So almost every aspect of the actual transaction is reviewed, verified, and analyzed by every potential partner. Right? So one of the reasons why we have to estimate market value is because you know competition value revelations all these things affect price but every transaction that is completed takes place at true market value right because you have you know in transactions you have what we call the potential for perfect substitutes What a perfect substitute is, is basically like a clone. You have all these different aspects that mirror the potential transaction, but it's not the real thing. All right? You clone yourself. It looks like you, talks like you, acts like you. But there's always a small tweak that you don't recognize or one small thing that's focused on that is not who you are. So you get a different perspective. You get you, looks like you, but it's not really you. And then the market value, because, you know, this is being dictated by everyone purchasing. It may not be the real right value.
And in private markets, right? Private is just one-on-one -on -one individual, corporation, corporation, individual, individual, partnership to individual, where we're not placing this in public. Every property is unique, right? There's always things that are different. They don't look alike. They don't do things alike. And they're highly segmented. They're local. You might not have all the information, but you have the majority of information. So there could be times where you feel like you are potentially making a blind purchase, which you really could be, right? Someone could tell you that the property looks like this, but it looks way different. Property could be this big, but it's really this big. So you are, you know, making an investment on he say, she say. And you want to avoid that, right? We want all the information possible so that it can be done, right? So if I'm buying a property, right, I want to make sure I have as much you know, as much potential information as possible so that I can make the most educated decision, right? This is an investment have to be made when you have what we call, again, I've mentioned this before, all information possible to make an educated decision. You want to make a smart investment. When you're doing private, it's a little bit harder for that because this could be coming from five to six different people. So you want to make you have to do your research. You have to do way more than just buying upon. You know, you're buying upon what someone else tells you, because it's not one. It could always not be true, or it could not be the correct information. So you are utilizing every possible aspect that you may have to get this information so that you can make the purchase. So everything is different, right? And then most people don't, like I said, you're doing information to back up the actual information. So you have the potential to spend money on that. And then you could be potentially paying people to give you this information. So, you know, price may not always be the price because people have finder's fees and all these types of things. And then and you got to pay for information. So does it really end up being good to buy in a private market sometimes? You know, it's not efficient. There's no regulation on it. But there's a lot of things that you have to just be cautious and aware about which is the most important thing. So where are the implications of these, of the system that's not necessarily perfect? No system is perfect. But in a situation like this, imperfections lead to inefficiency, which could lead to a lack of transactions. If information is not given completely in the way that it needs to be done, this could affect a lot, right? The deal could not be done. Right? So prices tells us a lot of things. A lot of times, the price that you may hear on a private market is not correct because that's already factoring in other fees and commissions, which most people don't think about from the beginning. They think about it once they get into the transaction. So you just have to officially understand everything and get as much information as possible. So an appraiser is someone who comes out and actually understands and looks at every possible part of the purchase 
and gives a value based upon, you know, how it looks, condition, what's sold around it, if there's anything like that property, all these different factors. So they are state certified and some of them may have a federal designation and certification. They have to follow ethics standards and appraisal standards. Each state is different, but the practice and the standards and the codes are pretty much the same. It's kind of hard to see, but that's the valuation process. So first thing you have to do is understand why you're there as an appraiser. Why am I here? What am I supposed to be doing? What is my goal? I need to make sure I meet the client, speak to the client and understand their intended use for this appraisal, right? The date that it was evaluated, what type of value are we estimating and what are some conditions or assumptions that we need to know, right? Even appraisers need information up front. And then we're determining the scope of work, time requirements, how long this appraisal report needs to be, what it needs to entail, and the procedures actually that it takes. Then we collect the data, we describe the property so that we can, first things first, make sure it's the right property, right? That's why we describe it, because we want to make sure it's the same property, right? So that's also important to understand what surrounds the property. Are there restaurants? Are there, you know, landmarks? Are there other apartments, right? What's in the neighborhood? What's the characteristics surrounding the property? And what are things that sold in the area before this sale or potential close of sale in the price? Right. Then we do a data analysis, supply, and demand. Right. What is what we call the highest and best use? What is the best way to use this program, to use this property, excuse me, in the most financial responsibly way, as well as the easiest way and the most profitable what's going to make the owner the most money as they're buying the product sorry keep saying product property what is the easiest way the most financial feasibly way and the profitable way to do that and is there anything that needs to be demolished renovated or remodeled to keep up the code and standards and what's the best use as if it was completely 100 percent vacant if you're buying with tenants in it all of these things are important. All of these things are necessary for us to understand the property itself. Now, in the United States, we have a lot of time, a lot of transactions where these are prevalent. And what I mean by that is you have a lot of times where you hear about properties being sold and you had no idea it was on the market. Zero to none. And they need to determine the value of the land. So here you have land value and improvement value. So you have the land as if it would be completely vacant, how much it's worth, and then the improvements on top of that. Those two numbers combined give you your property tax basis for an investment. And then you apply three approaches of valuation, sales, cost, and income. And, and kind of get the average of those values. And then you give a final value estimate in writing. Has to be in writing. It has to be either an appraisal report or restricted. It really doesn't matter. It's up to the client to choose. All right, so that's market value. And then what we will do is understand our sales comparison, right? So we're going to look at sales comparison approach, which is the value of real estate has to be determined by analyzing the properties that are similar to the analyzed to the property we're focusing on and its sale value. 
because looking at the market in itself, we have to be aware of what's going on so that we price it right so that we don't push people out to potentially might purchase a building or a property. Now, if they decide to pay leaps and bounds over that price that we advertised, that is their prerogative, right? It is their responsibility to hold up to that end of the bargain. But those types of things wouldn't happen if this property wasn't priced properly. So that's why the sales comparison is so important. We really have to look at these comparisons, how long ago it was to determine how rare it is that the property like this goes on the market. Or if it's been close, that means either this area is a growing area and people are seeing the investment, seeing opportunities to join, or it's a completely new area, or everybody's selling so that they can move out because the area might be bad. All these types of things are things that we are looking for and paying attention to. And in a competitive market, if you are looking for a property, you can't find it. Substitutes are going to sell close to the average price of the exact property you will be looking for. Right. So now selecting comparables, right? It has to be properties that you will consider a substitute, right? Height square footage, all that type of stuff is taken into account. It's like if I was going to the store and buy Sprite, but they were out of Sprite, what's the next closest thing that almost tastes like Sprite, looks like Sprite, and about the same price as Sprite? Same thing for the properties, right? They should not be far away. It should be a normal transaction, just direct you know, buyer to seller. All those types of things, it has to look basically exactly the same. That is the most important thing. If it doesn't look the same, if it's not close to the same size, it can't be used. If it's not the same square footage or square foot lot size. So it's like 500, 500 foot difference. Yes, that's okay. Thousand feet, right? Five more bedrooms. Doesn't work. So again, it has to be as close to a replica as possible. And the type of sale has to be the same type of sale you're doing. If you're doing a normal sale here, all the comparables have to be normal. It's an absolute must. Not, you know, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It has to be that has to be a must because the only way for it to happen that way to get accurate numbers is it has to look the same All right now here to get these you know comparable properties we have public records for us you can everywhere you go just call down to the property tax assessor we have a mls which is the multiple listing service which is um, an online database of all the homes in the market that have sold or could be sold, like if they're on the market currently. Private vendors, right? You can get a fee appraiser, which is similar to a regular appraiser, but they just do research, right? The first options are usually small, small um, payment fee or free. Right, so we always have to adjust. And then if we're going to adjust our comparables, the first thing we do is we look at transactions and then we look at our property adjustments. So if there's been updates, if there's been, you know, a remodel, if it's been a rehab, if it's been a demolition, all those things, have to be taken into account as far as the adjustment process. All right. 
And then you also get to see how the sale was actually done, right? Financing, right? If I sold it to a kid, right? How the market had it, when it was on the market, what it looked like, and if they purchased the right property, right? Sometimes what happens is people make mistakes and it could hold up a transaction, but you don't know that unless you actually call the agent or speak with the one, the buyer or the seller. So all these things have to be taken into account and we have to be prepared for. So I feel like this is a good place to stop for us so that we can go back in and write next week, look at more of the number side of this so we can look at the index, what we are preparing ourselves for when we're actually doing this right so some things to remember when we are purchasing a property it is all about research it is all about knowledge and being prepared right can't rush into the decision we got to make the smart decision we got to do our research we have to look at the market we also have to look at our target market if we're just purchasing this to update or sell to somebody else all of these things are important. All, all of these things are necessary. So we have to be prepared for it. And if we're not prepared, this deal is going nowhere. Right? This deal will not be done in the way we want it to be done. So we have to be ready for that. Does that make sense, everybody? All right? So keep that in mind. All of this stuff, you can use it everywhere you go in every type of real estate purchase. So if there are no questions, I will see you all next week. Have a great week. Thanks for showing up today. Have a great week. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Have a great week. Thank you. Thank you.